Okay, great. So um, thanks uh, for the invitation and uh, for the organizers to organize this uh, great workshop. Uh, so I'm going to talk about applications. Um, so this is actually a very important application. Um, uh, Dr. Fukushima had a slide saying that uh, uh, yeah, there's a question mark. So there are a set of important problems we need to solve to prevent that from happening. So this, I think, is one of them. Um, so who here are familiar with 2D object detection? I'm trying to see whether I should go over that very fast. Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with 2D object detection. Uh, okay, not, not that many, but I'm going to go over them uh, very quickly because uh, 3D object detection is based on uh, 2D object detection. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, give a, you know, specifically focus on 3D object detection for autonomous driving. So there are other use cases, but uh, this is the focus of the talk. Um, so I guess everybody has seen a self-driving car, and uh, I would like to show a video and uh, to let you appreciate, uh, you know, the difficult of the problem. So, and this is a very unstructured environment. Uh, as you can see, there are people walking and cyclists and uh, vehicles, and there are all these uh, <coughs> human actors uh, in the scene. And, you know, we need to basically solve the problem to uh, very good accuracy and reliability. And, okay, so first 2D object detection. Um, so we're all familiar with uh, classification, right? So object detection actually starts with classification network. So we just turn a classification network into a detection network. How do we do that? Um, so there are two type of object detection networks and according to the convention we have two stage uh, or one stage. So I'm going to be uh, uh, talk about exactly what is two stage, what is one stage. And if you think about it, uh, we need to detect objects in the, uh, in the image. And so if we actually know where, where the objects are, you know, we just crop it and say, you know, what is this object is, right? So that's exactly that simple idea. But as you can see that there are older uh, n squared number of windows. So n is, you know, the height by width of the image, right? So that's very huge. So typically people do, uh, instead of uh, having all the sliding windows, you subsample these uh, aspect ratios and uh, so you just reduce it to a manageable number, and this you actually use a prior knowledge of the object's size, you know, that can appear at different places of the image. And then uh, this is typically the, you know, the, the anchor grid that instead of a sliding window, you use anchor grid. And so then you have, you may have multiple stages. You want to first solve a simpler problem. Uh, for example, you want to first identify all the objects uh, in the scene before you do fine-grained classification, right? So the, the actually the reason is that, you know, in the image, there are so many, uh, like, background, uh, you know, like, backgrounds, right? So the, that a lot of time is, you know, you put a box there, it's going to be just background class. So we, ha we got huge imbalances. And so the two-stage network uh, typically works like this. Uh, you know, you got an image, and then you want to first figure out uh, where the objects are, right? So uh, you, you're going to find these, uh, you know, boxes, also called proposals, or a region of interest. And so, and once you find these, is going to be easier, right? So you just uh, crop it, and then you do pooling and resize it to a fixed, typically seven by seven region, and then you do classification, right? So this way you kind of, uh, you know, uh, made uh, the problem uh, simpler once you generated all these uh, 
uh, regions, right? And so the single stage actually doesn't do this, and uh, it just directly uh, classifies all output space elements. Um, uh, again, so the both uses this uh, anchor grid. So uh, instead of full uh, sliding windows, and then you just have anchor grid. So you, you the, the first one, you regress your proposals with respect to the anchors, right? That, that's from uh, your priors. And then uh, the second one just directly regress the, you know, the particular object uh, bounding boxes and also do the classification, right? And so if you look at this in a little more details, and so we're gonna first uh, do feature extraction from the uh, input image and then uh, so we have uh, image-wise computation, right? Once we do this, and uh, we have the features, and then we can generate proposals, uh, you know, by regressing uh, with respect to the uh, prior anchor uh, boxes, and then, uh, you know, for each of these crops or also called regions, and then we can run a per-region uh, convolutional network to. Uh, do the fine grain classification and regress on the 2D boxes. And so there are a lot of uh, work on this. So I essentially you can think of, uh, you, you kind of gradually uh, move the computation, right, to the common part. And so, you know, originally people just, uh, uh, you know, just find uh, the region of interest and then run convolutions uh, for each of the uh, regions, right? And then later on, people started sharing uh, convolutional layers uh, among many, uh, among all of these uh, uh, regions, right? So that actually made it much more efficient. And so the reason that people had this two-stage uh, network is that to, uh, because of the huge foreground and background imbalance and uh, it was uh, very difficult to, to uh, get very good result for the single stage network and that people typically use it for a lot of these embedded applications. But recently, uh, people figured out a way to actually uh, handle the extreme foreground background imbalances. I essentially, uh, there is a loss function called focal loss. So the, the difference from the, you know, the normal cross entropy losses you have a term that you penalize a lot of the uh, easy cases, uh, you know, so then uh, the, the gradients can focus on the, uh, the rare classes. And, well, they, it's a pretty simple architecture. I guess you're all familiar with this uh, uh, sort of feature pyramid network. So you get a feature pyramid network and you have and then for each of the levels, uh, you can do uh, classification and bounding box regression. Uh, so th the key is the loss function that allows you to do it in a single stage. Um, so now come to the uh, 3D object detection. What is actually 3D object detection? Um, so as you can see that, at least for autonomous driving, we have uh, LiDAR sensors which uh, will get us a, uh, a 3D point cloud uh, on the top, and then you also have RGB images. Uh, you could also get radar data. So for this talk, I'm gonna just focus on LiDAR and RGB. And that's our input. So what we need to do is to produce these uh, bounding boxes and place them uh, in the 3D world. So the car will know that, you know, where are these objects are, right? So that's the first thing we, we need to do. S uh, to give you a little more detail, and we get uh, RGB images, we also have uh, depth sensors, uh, for example, LiDAR, and we need to uh, attach semantic labels for each detection, meaning uh, each uh, 3D bounding boxes, and because they're occlusions, right, these 3D bounding boxes has to, uh, you know, has to cover the whole object, even part of it is occluded, right? So typically, we got 
you know, the center of the box and then the height, width, and length, and also the orientation. Um, so the uh, evaluation metric is uh, average precision with the 3D intersection over union threshold with respect to the ground truth. And uh, one of the example, uh, you know, PR curve is gonna be something like this. And then if you look at the area, that's your average precision. And uh, for this, uh, the 0 0.7, it means that uh, you only call it a detection if the box is actually overlaps with the ground truth for uh, more than 70%, right? So um, I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, two uh, papers and then I want you, you to know that there is a KD benchmark that uh, you know, people who do a 3D object detection, they will typically use this data set. And this is the leaderboard. I'm gonna talk about uh, two important ones. And uh, so there are separate metrics for uh, cars, for pedestrians and cyclists. And so Baidu just released a, a, new, uh, a bigger data set. So, and this uh, KD data set is actually pretty small. So I always tell people this is just a unit test. Um, but it has got us pretty far. And so if you do 3D detection, the first thing is to understand the characteristics of our sensor data, right? So if you uh, look at all these sensors, each one has their unique characteristics, and we need to leverage their special characteristics uh, to effectively do 3D detection, right? First, uh, LiDAR, they have, uh, right now at least, it has very limited range, and it has very non-uniform density, and as you get further, the number of LiDAR points you get from the objects is uh, much smaller, and it has intensity, but typically you get the shape information, and for the camera image, it got rich semantic information, but we don't have the depth information, and for radar, it's uh, much more sparse uh, compared with LiDAR. So how do we actually process 3D uh, point cloud data, right? So, you know, if you think about 3D point cloud data, there is sort of X, Y, Z, and plus intensity, right? So it's not in a regular grid like uh, the camera. So people typically just say project into 2D and render a 2D image, and then you run your favorite CNN architecture, or you actually uh, uh, quantize uh, the points uh, and to have voxel grids, and then you run 3D convolution. And there's some recent work which uh, says that uh, you know these actually are not uh, very good to keep the shape information, so instead we're gonna do operations on points directly. So here's the motivation. And so for uh, 2D CNN, we get really deep image features. They're mo mostly, uh, well, you know, you get shape information, but you, you also get appearance information. Uh, for 3D point cloud, and so we wanna uh, get uh, geometric features, right? So, and if CNN is not, uh, you know, good enough, so what we should do? And so if you think about it, we got point cloud, that's, all, you know, unordered points, uh, D dimension, the raw input is four dimension, you got X, Y, Z in intensity. And these, uh, uh, these endpoints and, it, you know, like, they can be perm permuted. So your operation should be permutation invariant, right? So, and so what point that does is you do, you learn a symmetric function, meaning like it's invariant to the input permutation, right? There are simple functions that's input uh, invariant, which is say max and uh, sum, right? So uh, the question is how can we uh, really construct these networks? is actually pretty simple. We got, uh, say, uh, you know, each uh, three-dimensional uh, vector is a uh, point in the point cloud, and then 
you just pass them through uh, some transformations, H, right? H is shared among all these uh, points, and then you apply a simple symmetric function, and then and you, you further do uh, some, uh, apply another function, right? So uh, the symmetric function could be just uh, max, right? And then the further processing will be multilayer perceptron, right? This is the basic point net. And this is actually pretty uh, interesting if you visualize the what features uh, you know you can actually uh, extract. So, uh, so each one of these is a particular H function. You look at all the points uh, in these uh, cubes, right? You see that uh, you know you apply H to the point. If uh, it's more than 0 0.5, you you just plot it here. Right? So. It ha can attract very interesting shape primitives. Um, so come back to uh, how do we want to do uh, 3D object detection. Right? So there are approaches which just do uh, LiDAR only. And so this uh, recent paper from Apple called VoxelNet, uh, so it just do a 3D convolution, right? And it's a single stage network. So instead of uh, you do voxelization and then you know, you, you just, uh, uh, you know, quantize it. Uh, so what they do, you, they actually, for each voxel, you can apply a point net to extract, you know, these uh, interesting shape features. It turns out to work very well. And so for this talk, I'm gonna just focus on multi-sensor fusion. Um, so 2D detection, we get 2D boxes, and then 3D detection, we, we want to get, uh, uh, 3D boxes, right? And then we want to leverage uh, both shape information and uh, reach uh, semantic information from, uh, uh, you know, uh, images and LiDAR. Uh, so based on what, you know, I introduced, right? There are two stage, single stage uh, for 2D detection, and this carries over to 3D. And you could do 2D convolutions, 3D convolution, or point net based. And uh, for since we're fusing it, there are particular ways of fusing them. You can just fuse them. Uh, you can take the feature vector from each of these uh, 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 two sensors, and then you can fuse them, uh, for example, in the network, or you can do them sequentially. Uh, this is going to be clear soon. And so I'm going to uh, particularly talk about two type of uh, uh, detectors and. Uh, so this will make it clear that how the space of 3D object detection uh, uh, works, right? So this one, uh, we actually do a uh, two-stage. And so you first generate 3D uh, proposals, right? And then you project these proposals to uh, the different views, right? So, you pro so, so here you project the uh, 3D point cloud into multiple 2D views, right? And then there's the top-down view, which is called bird view, and then there's the front view. And, and so you have separate trunks, and, uh, and then you just fuse them. And to give you some more details, and this is the LiDAR point cloud data, and uh, we just project them into uh, different 2D views, and then you manually engineer uh, features, right? So, yeah, and then you, uh, with the, uh, you, you based on the object proposal on the LiDAR top-down view, you run through 2D convolutions. Again, you have these, uh, you know, 3D anchor grids, and then you, you basically regress these uh, region proposals with respect to your prior anchor grids, and then and you get your uh, proposals, which uh, means that uh, you know these proposals are very likely to contain your objects. And then, uh, so this is the proposal network, and here, these are the 3D prior boxes uh, with different aspect ratios. Okay, once you got the uh, proposals, and then, like I said, you can just uh, project them into the different 2D views, right? And then uh, you crop the, each of the views. 
yeah, and then once you crop them, you can actually uh, do object detection. So here's uh, the particular way. So M is uh, the fusion uh, operator. You could say simply just average of these feature vectors. And uh, you, uh, you could have sort of multi-layer interaction among these uh, fused feature vectors. And then you got classification and regression multitask loss. And you know, the, the way uh, you know, the fusion network works is that you want to have auxiliary losses so that each of the um, sort of the views and s still uh, learn the particular views uh, features, right? So these are the, the why we need these auxiliary losses. So that, that's the uh, one of the network that does uh, 3D detection. So now I'd like to move over to a very recent work from Stanford, which, uh, you know, it's a very uh, interesting way of uh, doing 3D detection. So essentially, we first actually do 2D detection, right? Because 2D detection is actually very mature. So we get 2D detection. And for each of the 2D detections, because we have the camera projection metrics, we can actually, uh, you know, look add to the frustrum of each 2D detection, and then we can get the uh, 3D point clouds uh, from the frustrum. So, yeah, the, the key idea is to leverage a uh, mature 2D detector and to re reduce the search space, and then solve the 3D detection problem using a uh, point cloud. And so, why do this, right? So, well, you know, because 2D detector is pretty mature, you know, it's sort of reasonable to leverage it. But then once you get 2D detection and then you can project your uh, 3D point cloud onto that detection, uh, why not just directly regress uh, the 3D boxes, right, uh, with the RGBD image? And so the, the reason is that if you look at this particular example, right, so you got a person in front of the person, you have uh, bicycles, right? And then you also have, you know, the buildings at the back. And so uh, if you uh, directly do uh, the estimation from RGB the image, the occlusion and clutter is going to be uh, very challenging, right? I if you do it, uh, you know, using the 3D point cloud data within that uh, frustrum, because uh, objects are naturally separated in 3D space, right? It's uh, much easier. And so uh, F-point that the com uh, complete architecture can be decomposed into uh, three key modules. There is the uh, uh, frustrum proposal, uh, which do 2D detection. From 2D detection, you, you, you get the uh, 3D point cloud uh, in that frustrum, which is the whole uh, process is called frustrum proposal stage. And once you get, you kind of narrowed your search, and then in that uh, frustrum, you then do 3D instance segmentation. Because in that frustrum, there are other objects uh, that you're not interested, right? You want to uh, segment uh, to the, do segmentation to get the object of interest. So once you get that, you then, uh, regress to the a modal uh, 3D boxes, meaning that the box has to cover the whole object even if it's not fully visible. Uh, these are naturally the three stages. So I'm going to go into a little more details. Um, so we got RGB image, we got you know 3D point cloud data, right? So we need to get. Uh, all the latter points in the frustrum of uh, a particular detection, right? So how does that work? So we got RGBD data, and uh, we run them through 2D object detection, which I just give an overview, right? You can pick your favorite 2D uh, object detection detector, and then you get these uh, uh, 2D detections, right? And then because of it have the camera projection matrix, 
uh, we can actually lift the 2D region into 3D frustrum. And then you take all the points in the frustrum of a particular 2D detection. Let's say they're n points, right? So this uh, point cloud corresponding to a 2D detection is called a frustrum point cloud. So we need to localize object in this uh, frustrum by point cloud segmentation. And so the input is the frustrum point cloud. And then we need to do uh, per point binary segmentation. And so once we finish the segmentation, we actually just uh, carve out the object of interest. So this you reduce the endpoints into endpoints. And then you also give the one hop class vector to the segmentation network so that it has prior information of the object. So then uh, after segmentation, we already got our object of interest. Uh, then we want to uh, get to the 3D boxes. And remember that uh, we, we don't have, you know, uh, LiDAR points cover the whole image, right? So we need to do a model uh, 3D box uh, estimation. So the input is object point cloud, and uh, we need to regress to the 3D boxes. This you can apply uh, point nets, uh, which I just briefly described. So that's a brief overview of uh, this work. So you do 2D detection, and then you get the 3D frustrum uh, using the camera projection matrix, and then you do 3D segmentation, and then you do 3D box regression. And so I'd like to uh, emphasize uh, the key why this performs uh, very well. So uh, you know, number one, uh, you don't lose the uh, 3D shape information by doing these quantization and uh, uh, projection. You directly operate uh, on the uh, raw point cloud. And there are a series of coordinate transforms, uh, which I didn't go into the details, which uh, you know, make it easy for the network to, uh, to learn, to canonical canonicalize the learning problem. There is also some tricky loss functions to, to make the bounding box regression easier. So there's some uh, of the results, uh, you know, uh, detections, I guess, to give you a sense, uh, you know, how difficult the problem is. Uh, as you can see that if you, uh, you know, closer to, uh, you know, to the vehicle, you see a lot of points. If you look further, the before, and that one is, has a much fewer uh, points, right? And then, uh, you know, even with fewer points, uh, it, it actually works pretty well. There are, uh, but there are, you know, there are cases where you don't get very good uh, box regression. If you look at the, the, the blue and red box, the, so the red is the, uh, regress box, the blue is the ground truth. You see they're pretty off because they're just too few ladder points to get a good uh, detection. And then, of course, we rely on 2D detection. And then if uh, you miss a 2D detection, you won't be able to detect uh, the object. So if you look at the blue boxes there, and that one, there is no detection. The blue box is the ground truth. And then, uh, if you look at the red box there, and so there's strong occlusion. Uh, actually, I don't see, the I even in the image, C uh, zero. That C means cyclist. There is a cyclist behind those two persons. And then for those two persons, they're kind of next to each other. And it's, it's uh, very hard cases. And then again, uh, in these cluttered environments, if you look at P10, that's P is pedestrian, uh, is is with a bunch of uh, uh, bicycles, right? So it's very hard to detect in a cluttered environment. And so this is the current stage of uh, uh, 3D object detection, and the community has made a lot of progress. And uh, 
I think we're far from actually solving it for mission critical applications. There are near term di directions. And so, for example, uh, one of the ideas to better extract shape features uh, using better mechanism than uh, point net because point net does uh, you know point wise operations uh, so there is a recent work that from MIT actually uh, you do operations on edges and so you can uh, capture the local ship information better and then uh, another idea is that you can aggregate information from uh, multiple frames because each frame you get uh, uh, a single frame, you get limited number of points. Uh, multiple frame actually give you more information. You could also uh, try multitask. There are other tasks that, you know, that for example, prediction task or tracking task. And then uh, these are near-term uh, veins. Uh, I don't think we can get there uh, with the, you know, these near-term uh, ideas. So longer term, uh, we need to really uh, robustly extract uh, shape features. And uh, I think the brain does shape feature extraction much more robustly, and it's, it's doing it in a very different way. And also, the current uh, representation we learn from these uh, deep nets and because they're easily food, and uh, they're actually not robust, and it's not learning very abstract representations, so it doesn't really generate, uh, generalize very well to uh, you know, a uh, new environment. And uh, so, uh, uh, we, ne we need a more uh, you know, uh, fundamental uh, breakthroughs and to solve the problem. Any questions, comments? So maybe I have one question. So about the uh, 3D uh, object detection, have you or how about the self-driving car in Uber? They already applied or uh, still on? How is the progress? Oh, <laughs> I cannot comment. It's on if the it's not secret. secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, can't I can't comment on the specific things we do, but uh, uh, you know, this represents the state of the art. There are engineering issues, yeah. So, but in terms of like high level approaches, that, you know, this is the, uh, yeah, what the community is right now. When in your self driving car, do you think it's important to know outside the box what's out there? Like, just other than objects, uh, do you think it's important for the car to actually understand other parts of the scene? Uh, what do you mean? C can you give me an example? I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, well, I'm just uh, asking, like, other than object detection, do you really need to understand the scene of what actually the context of the scene is and how much the car doesn't know about it? Do you think it's an issue? in the future and oh, yes. people should work yeah, on that? That's, that's right. So I just talked about object detection. So uh, definitely C understanding is uh, very important. So a simple rule is that anything that can change the, your driving behavior, and then you should know about it, right? So which means that if a cyclist gesture the car, then you should understand it. If uh, there is a person directing traffic, you need to know, right? If it's construction zone, and then you need to understand the, you know, the where the cones are, where where the, well, where you should drive, right? So, yeah. Again, a simple rule: if it changes your, if it affects your driving behavior, you should know. If not, then you don't need to know. Any more questions? So one, one question. So. Uh, in your talk, you're using some range finders. Range finders for detect uh, distance, right? Uh, that's the LiDAR. Yeah, LiDAR. Yeah. 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 But, uh, is it possible to use several cam cameras? Because it looks very expensive. So you <laughs> just using several cameras. Well, the... Uh, the uh, 
Uh, first of all, the, the, the cost uh, is high right now, but once you do mass production, it will be low, and that's one. Uh, you, the, one of the things I didn't mention is that uh, you could try multiple cameras, and then you, you basically do object detection with uh, multiple cameras, and uh, that, that's stereo vision. Uh, that, that's the holy grail of computer vision. Um, so it will be solved at some point. I don't think we're going to solve it very soon. So eventually, it could be possible, but now we're not at the stage to, uh, to actually solve it using multiple cameras, reconstruct 3D scenes, and then do object detection. That people have been trying that. Again, that's the uh, holy grail, but uh, uh, people don't know how to do it. Yeah. 